that perhaps I can say X marks the spot because every time we come up here, the heart starts beating faster. <laughs> and this turns to jelly. But at least this morning I was found among the YA. Never mind. No. <laughs> we found, I was found among the YA, anyone below 60, but I overqualify anyway. But this morning I, um, I was being tasked to reflect on um, this passage in Luke 19, 44, which you all know is supposed to be Palm Sunday. So I'll come back next week. Never mind. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'd like to now, let me get this thing working. Uh, take us through a few verses and let us, let us concentrate, let us maybe look into what uh, Scripture says. It is so familiar, these verses, that we normally flee through it. And, and say, uh, that was Palm Sunday. I like the phrase, nothing happens in the vacuum. I think someone came up with this phrase during the Israel-Gaza problem, and the person was quickly asked to give up their, their post, someone in the United Nations. But nothing happens in the vacuum, and I added this here because Leading up to here, leading up to Luke 19, uh, Jesus has been going from village to village, city to city, performing miraculous acts and signs. He, he raised Lazarus. He then healed a man born blind. Every time that happens, people start to gather and follow to see more. A lot of people like miracles. They will follow, and of course, along with them will be the religious leaders who will take every opportunity to see what trouble they can create. So the crowd builds up, and why I brought this up is, as we come to Luke 19, we saw the general theme that actually Jesus seeks Changes, saves, and transport, transform people. Zacchaeus is one of them. I remember long ago I was asked to uh, prepare a talk on, on this exactly one, and, and the first thing that came to my mind was it was all designed and planned by God. Jesus went through Jericho to avoid um, Samaria, and Zacchaeus, why would he be interested? He's a rich man sitting here happily collecting taxes, but he got interested. So Jesus sought out, or the Spirit sought out and transformed people. There is one portion that we didn't, uh, was at, not added to the, the speaking track for this month. Jesus also gave a parable about the slaves, and that was when it fits in nicely that the people that Jesus saves, Jesus' people, has worked in his kingdom while waiting for him to return. And, and so are we. And so now we come to um, Luke nineteen twenty-eight. So let us read this, just two pages of it, uh, and that bring us uh, swiftly into looking at some of it. We can't, we don't have enough time to look at everything in there. Yeah? Let me read it out to you. You can read it out if you want to. Verse 28, And when he, Jesus, had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. That this will be the last time he would do that. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a coat tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. 
If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord has need for it. Simple instructions. So those who were sent went away and found it, as he said, as he had told them, and they were untying the coat. His owner said, why are you untying the coat? And he just said, the Lord has need for it. Period. And they brought it to Jesus, throwing their cloaks on the coat. They set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he, Jesus, answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace? But now, They are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave a single stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. As uh, the present church, you will always say, may the Lord as his richest blessings to the reading of his word. So let's ask the Lord to bless the reading of his word. Father, we thank you this morning. You continue to make it possible for us to open your word to hear what you have to say. And in the way of worshipping you, Father, may your spirit draw our hearts to hear you. Help me, O Lord, to um, to be careful with words that only your messages will touch our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, let us go on. And I promise you, it won't take so long. This is the shortest one I've ever prepared. (laughs) Someone's laughing. With my children. Well, when I look at this, I thought this morning we can look at it in this way that as the crowd meets a king, or I took the liberty to change the little, because there's only one king. Firstly, we saw how it was revealed that he is king. The king revealed. And he showed in, proclaimed in public. But it ended with a king grieved. Well, let's just do this. In verses 28 to 35, we start off with when Jesus said these things, he said, go and bring me that coat. Go and say to the owner that the Lord has need for it. And he even told them where to find his coat. It shows us the king. Jesus was the creator king. That he owns all these things. And if I may think, nowadays with all the advance in technology and, and wealth management and things around the world, is that Jesus owns all creations? Sometimes it's hard for us to wrap our head around. But the Bible says so. The king is all knowing. Ah. But this wasn't done in a vacuum, neither. Back in Zechariah 9 9, it already says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. 
shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming. Righteous and having salvation, you see, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a goat, fall of a donkey. Unlike the kind of king that the Jews were waiting for or looking for, the kind that one would be a warrior king that had been long waiting for someone to overthrow Rome and give them back their nation. But here, we have Jesus, and he is known as the Prince of Peace, isn't he? King of Peace. He didn't come for war. But they did not register that. The Jews, as, as we always say, was given the temple worship, was given the scriptures. But somehow, they missed the point along the way. Somehow, the point was missed. But well, here, the next thing that we saw, what Jesus commands all things is the coat which no one has ever set on. Now, we haven't experienced this, not in Malaysia, but we might have seen in movies that they had to break in every single horse, donkey, and things that you ride on. It's not always an easy job. Look at what scripture has to say, Isaiah 1.3, the ox knows his owner. The donkey is master's creep, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. God lament. So here we are, a good demonstration when Jesus sat on the coat, he submitted to Jesus. As I was saying, uh, leading up to here, along the way, the miraculous signs drew a lot of attention. But it was meant to reveal that Jesus is Messiah. They were all meant to say, to show that he is the Son of God, Son of the Living God. And here, the next few verses, Jesus is about to be publicly proclaimed. The question that I want to leave at this point for us is, who is Jesus to you? I know I'm, speak, I'm here sharing in church, and we would think that everyone had a chance to, to spend time knowing Jesus. In the chance, off chance that you may still be asking the question, who is Jesus really? This morning we're talking about the King. Who is Jesus really? So if you have questions, we have our elders and, and deacons and people around, please do ask. The next portion of it, the king heralded in. Now, it didn't occur to me until when I sat down and, and started reading this carefully, for all the things that Jesus had been doing in the three years, the miracles sign, or signs that he performed, he had often said to the one, do not tell anyone. And some he says, go and wash your eyes, go to the temple, go to the priest and make an offering. Jesus has kept himself away from the crowd. And of course, he knew that the crowd were just too happy uh, to look for a leader. They lead them on a revolt against the government. Even after feeding the 4,000, the 5,000, he got on the boat off the shore, if you remember, to speak to them. They, they cannot reach him. And then he would quietly slip away, obviously, to pray too. This is the first time that Jesus had his people proclaim him. So as he drew near and came to the Mount of Olives, a whole multitude of his disciples, probably by then more and more had saw the commotion and follow. I can't help but think further forward in Revelation 7, 9. After this, I looked and behold, this is the Apostle John given the vision, a great multitude that no one could number. You know, 
come Easter, if this room was filled up, we always say, wow, you know, what a big crowd. But there is no number big enough to count right, that multitude. Every nation, every tribe, people, languages. And, and we would wish all of us would be there. I don't know if we are standing next to each other at that time. That big and more. With palm branches in their hands, could we be pro proclaiming the God and King? And so he was there. And the people were proclaiming this. So nothing happened in a vacuum. God had things planned. Psalm 11826, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And this is probably where the Jews got instructions from to proclaim the coming of the Messiah. But what they did not, maybe didn't read the next verse, that says that the Lord is God, he has made his light to shine upon us, bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. What this says is that this, this king that is coming, he was there to be sacrificed. The atonement sacrifice that needs to be made. Jesus was there to die. To die that we might live, to die that they might live. And that was a message that seemed to have gone lost in translation, as we like to say, um, as the years go on among the Jews. The multitude, and I would think that at that time, although it says multitude of his disciples, among them the apostles, the twelve, among them the disciples, the followers that had gathered, um, I don't know, don't remember the number, it could be in the hundreds by then. And of course, the onlookers, the followers, to see what great things they can see. And they were there. The thought to these different people were different things. To them, some would be looking for that Messiah, a leader. Could it be a, like a religion or a culture, even for us? that Christianity becomes a religion, things that we do regularly. It's a set pattern and things that we we'll do year in, year out, like many religions that we know. If it did all these things, I deserve salvation. No. Worse still, if we, it became a culture to us, we we're born and raised in a Christian family and these other things, you know, we are nice and warm within the four walls or a habit, or is Jesus really king? Is he, is he a part in our thoughts, in our plans? And over time, our likes and dislikes. Is Jesus really king? And now come to the part that Jesus went on getting nearer to Jerusalem, where so out of the blues of our I guess we all knew it would come. The Pharisees in the crowd. That's why I said the crowd is made up of all kinds of people, the multitude there. Asked him to silence his disciples. The king was rebuked by his own. The Pharisees, religious leaders, were entrusted with the temple and the teachings. And here we have them totally missed out who Jesus is instead asking him to keep quiet. John, in his gospel, in chapter 1, already in chapter 1, said he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, his own people did not receive him. Can you imagine if you're a brilliant architect and someone asks you to design and help build this magnificent mansion and then you have a housewarming party with all your friends in there, 
the owners welcoming them. Everybody congratulated him and said, what a magnificent house you've built. And there you are, the architect sitting in the corner with a cup of tea, and, and he didn't really point to you and thank you for the wonderful work. There was only a minuscule thing, and here is the king of universal creation coming to his own people. Not only that, they were supposed to know that he came, he is coming to die for them, for the need of his righteousness. They didn't. But the hearts were hardened. And so Jesus said, would, would that you, even you, had known this day the things that make for peace? In a way, he was saying, how can it be that you have ignored what it will take to make peace between God and you? God and sinners. The things that would take to make peace. And the Bible tells us um, the Israelites, the Jews, were then hidden from this truth. Even until today, the majority of the Israelites do not believe in Jesus. The New Testament has no part in their, uh, the, the Orthodox or the ultra-Orthodox uh, in Judaism. In fact, they dislike the, uh, the Jewish Christians and the churches over there. Last year was, I don't know if that news caught your attention, they started to parade and spat at the church, the Christians and the church. So the Jews continue to hate the church because they are still waiting for a Messiah and the Christians had proclaimed that Jesus is the Messiah. And here, the whole point is missed. And Jesus said, your heart's hardened. And there is a consequence. He goes, he did for me, I suppose 43 onwards. For the days will come upon you when your enemies, that would happen in AD 70, as we now know in history, under Titus. Not our Titus. Not you, are. Huh? <laughs> under Titus, AD 70. And there you see, in Micah. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed as the field, Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins. Read a few chapters on Luke 21. Uh, there's more detail. 20, 21, 24, 25 onwards, and more detail on what that day will be like. And it had happened. AD 70. And when our Lord returns again, that is only a glimpse of what the world can become. There are consequences in ignoring or rejecting the Lord. And the question is, if anyone do not really know this Jesus we're talking about, is this perhaps time of your visitation? In other words, is this the opportunity God has given you to know? Do not be shy or afraid to ask anyone who this Jesus is. I thought I picked, I picked this up from these verses, although it's normally preached or normally read as Palm Sunday and welcoming the king. You can do it again next week. But it's important enough that they are welcoming the king in your heart, not welcoming another religious or festive day of the, of the Christian calendar, just that. The world has turned it into a rabbit and uh, Easter eggs and chocolates celebration. Maybe not here in Kuala Lumpur, but in some other towns, East Malaysia, Singapore, you probably see rabbits, uh, or what would you call that, treasure hunts and things. But the devil is clever. He turns everything into a game, 
anything that says not God. You'd be glad to know that in closing, in closing, I just want to leave you with this, with this few words. Take a look at it. Do contemplate, if Christians and non-Christians alike, who truly is Jesus to you? We are approaching Easter. We know he died. We know he rose again. Is this living Jesus your king, your savior? Who truly is Jesus? You don't look at uh, movies, they use the name of Jesus in all kinds of things. Is Jesus a religion? Is it just things that you do, or I do? I don't know whether my boys and my wife, is, normally I will sit down very quiet, otherwise I'm very noisy at home. But I guess I have to do this. this. You have to think hard, is Jesus a religion, a culture? I am actually considered one and a half. Not first generation Christian, not second generation, because my mom was a believer. And we have very little Christian teachings from young until we were like late teens. But if you are yourself second or third generation Christians in this or other church, do think about this. Who really is Jesus? And if you are hearing this over and over again or, or the fir first time, God plans his timing well. He's all, we are given the chance to know him. Is this time of your visitation? Or for you and I, is it the time that God is telling us, hey, wake up. A Christian in this world is just not attending meetings and now, we do have a lot of makanis. It's more than that. Yeah, it's more than that. So I'd like to, um, before I just hand the time over to the elders, as we were singing just now about who Jesus is to us, the lyrics of the song came to mind, and I, I, I'm sure you know this. If you know Jesus, this hymns, lyrics will mean to you. When peace like a river, Isabel, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like the billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It's written by someone who has lost his, uh, some of his family, and as he sailed past the waters where the ship went down and his daughters died, knowing Jesus, it is well. So I pray that we all will know Jesus King and know Jesus really. Is, knowing is having a relationship. He is a real person in life. And Easter will tell us that he arose, he is alive and with us. So I'll pass the time back to the elder.